This is the Kids Have Sons editorial board. We're talking to Bob Scales, who's a candidate for Kids Have County Prosecutor. And Bob will invite you to introduce yourself. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, as David said, I'm Bob Scales. I'm running for Kitsap County Prosecuting Attorney. Um, I've been a Kitsap resident for the last 15 years. Um, my background includes, I graduated from the University of Washington uh, back in 1994. And uh, my first job was as a King County Deputy Prosecutor. And I did that job for six years. And I ended up developing a specialization in uh, juvenile firearm cases. There were a lot of gang violence problems in the, in the mid-90s. And I developed a special vertical prosecution program to more effectively prosecute the juvenile uh, offenders. As part of that program as well, I, I became a special assistant United States attorney. And we handled uh, cases that were transferred, adult felony cases that were transferred from state court to federal court. Uh, uh, involving armed career criminals, and these were individuals that had three or more uh, felony convictions and they ended up possessing a firearm, which under federal law is a mandatory minimum 15 year sentence. So we developed a program to more effectively prosecute the most violent, uh, dangerous offenders in our community with firearms. Um, after that, I worked for uh, about 10 years with the city attorneys, I'm sorry, with the C city of Seattle uh, as a policy advisor to. Uh, uh, both Mayor Schell and, and Mayor Nichols. And I handled a wide variety of, of, of public safety matters, uh, everything ranging from uh, protests and demonstrations to homeless encampments to uh, uh, open air drug markets uh, to gun violence, um, and, and handled a, just a wide variety of, of very complex and controversial um, issues, and advised the mayor and managed a number of public safety projects for the city of Seattle. Um, I then worked for the uh, city attorney uh, when Pete Holmes was elected uh, and took office in 2010. He wanted me to come and be the director of his government affairs section. Um, and the government affairs section in the city attorney's office had 10 attorneys. I managed 10 attorneys, um, two paralegals, and two legal assistants. And we handled uh, public disclosure uh, requests. Uh, we handled uh, constitutional issues, so when there were First Amendment issues uh, brought against the city, um, my op my uh, section would handle that. Um, and so I'm the only candidate in this race that has both prosecution, criminal prosecution experience as well as hands-on uh, civil experience, which is very important for the prosecutor's office. Um, I'm currently working as the compliance coordinator for the Seattle Police Department, and I manage the uh, settlement agreement with the Department of Justice involving the pattern of practice of excessive force that they found against the Seattle Police Department. I think my time is up. <laughs> Um, well, I'll ask you, I'll, I'll, we'll start off with a question that's kind of along these lines anyway. Um, it sounds like you spent a lot of your career over Seattle and learning how to do that. What's, uh, what's your motivation in wanting to work in Kitsap now? Sure. Um, so I, I went to school at the University of Washington, so I was living, my, my, I've, I've lived in Seattle. Uh, we moved to Seattle in 1977. And my family still, my mother still lives in, in Magnolia, and so I, I was living in Magnolia um, during law school and when I started at the prosecutor's office. And uh, then when we had uh, our son, uh, we wanted to look at where, where do we want to live, where do we want to grow up, uh, have our son grow up and go to school. And uh, so we chose Bainbridge Island. Um, and so we moved to Bainbridge Island in, in 1999 and uh, 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 have lived there since then, so the last 15 years. And so, but my, my work career, you know, continued to be in Seattle and King County, and so I would commute in, bicycle commuter and commuted in every day to, to work uh, there. Um, but I was very interested in being involved in my own community and re recognized that a lot of my, my public service work was over in Seattle and I didn't live there and I wanted to get more involved in my own community. So in 2003, I ran for the Bainbridge Island City Council, um, and at that time I ran unopposed, and I served uh, four years on the Bainbridge Island City Council, and uh, then decided that you know, I'd done what I wanted to do, and my work was done, and so I left the, the City Council, and then uh, after I left, I, I became very concerned with, with the direction that the city was headed, um, particularly with its finances, and uh, they were borrowing money um, to pay the bills, they were issuing bonds to pay the, the salaries, 
and, and I became very concerned about that. And so I, I decided I was going to run for mayor at the time. At the time, the city had a strong mayor form of government. But at the same time, there was a movement to change the form of government. And, and that's what eventually prevailed. And so they went to a council manager form of government, so there was no mayor. So I decided that, that I, could, I could serve my community best by running for the city council again. And I ran against Debbie Vansel, who was my colleague uh, previously on the council, and I won that election and served for four years and just finished in December of last year. And the first year uh, during my second term, the city council selected me to be mayor. So I was mayor of Bainbridge Island in 2010, obviously not a strong mayor form of government, basically a leader for the council. And in that one year period, we were able to completely turn the city's finances around. We, when I started, we were on Moody's Credit Watch. Uh, the city was running deficits and borrowing, issuing bonds to stay afloat. Uh, by the end of the first year uh, that I was mayor, we had uh, several million dollars in reserves. We were taken off Moody's Credit Watch. Um, it was a very difficult process. Um, we had to do a lot of reorganization, a lot of cuts. There were a lot of unpopular decisions that were made, but they were necessary, and we got the city on track. And just recently, the city's bonds were again uh, upgraded by Moody's, and, and financially, the city is on incredibly solid footing. We did that in, in a record amount of time. So I've always had an interest in, in giving back and, and serving the community, and I did so for eight years. And, and after I finished on the city council, I was uh, you know, looking for other opportunities to serve and, and, and recognizing that, that um, this position was, was uh, opening up. And I thought, well, you know, where, where am I? My sort of personal, my family life, you know, my son's gone off to college um, and I have a little, more, a little more free time. We're less involved in soccer uh, than we were. Um, and you know what's what's the best thing for me? What's the best way if I can give back to the community? And running for prosecutor just seemed like the ideal time, the ideal opportunity. I think I'm the ideal candidate for the position. And um, and there's there's so much that I have learned, so much experience that I have gained um, working in a larger jurisdiction such as Seattle and King County that I think I can bring to bear. Um, and, and new ideas, a fresh perspective um, is what I think both the office and, and county government need. Explain that one a little bit more, maybe. That's really good. Like, when you say, I want to give back, want to do something different, what is the fresh perspective that you see is needed? Well, one of the things that I've, I've done during the campaign, um, as of today, uh, my campaign has doorbelled uh, 3,487 homes in Kitsap County, all over the county. And I personally have spoken to over 1,000 uh, voters in Kitsap County, all over the county. And, and I've, in these last two months, I've learned a lot about the specific concerns, the problems, um, the frustrations that people have uh, with, with county government. Um, and uh, you've probably heard this before, but I don't know how many people have, told, have referred to Kitsap County as Kidnap County. Um, there's, there's not a lot of, of respect, there's a lot of mistrust, uh, there's a lot of frustration, um, and, and I think it, it boils down to, you know, people don't feel that they're, they're being treated fairly. People don't feel that the, the county government is responding uh, in an appropriate manner to their concerns. And, and people feel that some people get a break depending on who you are. Some people, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a vindictiveness that runs through some things and, and people are, are, are prosecuted relentlessly. Uh, so you're not treated fairly or inequitably. Um, and one of the specific things that I've heard, um, particularly in, in Suquamish and in, in uh, downtown Bremerton, a real concern about chronic nuisance properties. And so these are properties, generally you have an absentee landlord uh, and, and you, have, you have drugs, prostitution, gangs, violence, noise, garbage, um, and, and people complain, and they say, look, we complain, we call the police, we call the sheriff's office, you know, nothing is, nothing is done, the prosecutor's office won't do anything, and we have exactly the same problems over in Seattle. And one of the things I did when I was the Director of Government Affairs, uh, uh, the Seattle City Council passed a, a new chronic nuisance property ordinance. And I was responsible working with the police department in coordinating um, the responses, and, and I managed a team of attorneys, uh, community liaison prosecutors, to, to do that. Um, and together, uh, we, we uh, basically what, what you do is you, you, can't just, you can't just arrest people and then expect the problem to go away. So what you do is you bring together, you have a, a, a basically a, 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 a tool list uh, of things that you can do to address the, the problems. And so, 
For example, um, you know, you have health code violations, you have land use code violations, you have uh, things that you can do with the, um, with the landlord in terms of abatement of the property if the landlord is unresponsive. The main thing is to bring the landlord into the picture and get them to help manage the problem and generally it's, it's getting rid of who's ever, who's ever living there. Um, and the way that we did that was we, we set up a program with uh, community liaison prosecutors. So these were prosecutors that actually stationed in the precincts. There were four prosecutors. I managed that program. And these prosecutors didn't have a, a full caseload. What they, what they did was they worked with law enforcement. They worked, worked with uh, community groups, businesses, neighborhood groups to deal with these chronic issues. And so the community liaison prosecutor would, would get a complaint about a chronic nuisance property. They would work with law enforcement and the neighbors to try to identify what specifically the problems were. They would gather information, uh, complaints, um, uh, uh, cases that, were, that had been filed. And then we would use the chronic nuisance um, uh, ordinance to essentially craft a correction agreement um, with the landlord or the property owner um, to deal with those nuisance properties. And, and if the uh, property owner was unwilling, then the city could send put the property through abatement proceedings, but in every case we found willing property owners, we would enter into a contract and then they would work with us and with our code enforcement and with law enforcement to deal with the problem. So that's sort of one yeah, no, that, example. That is actually an interesting um, thing, and I'll ask, I, I don't think you were trying to say that was your top priority, so I do want to ask that question, but let me ask one other thing. Um, you said when you're knocking on doors you hear people um, kind of say these things about the office and prosecutor relentlessly was one of the the, the things that you're hearing. Um, a, I wonder if you could explain a little bit, where do you see that happening and what sorts of things should they back off on a little bit that, that you in response to? And second one, is that a comment about the kids have a rifle and revolver range? Right. Well, obviously it's not surprising that that's, that's what I hear about a lot when I go out. Um, and, and, and would you handle that differently? Absolutely, I would handle it differently. Um, my understanding, obviously, you know, one of the dangers in, in being a candidate and, and not being the actual prosecutor is that I don't have access to all, all the information that you know, somebody who's actually handling the case is. So all I can go on is what I've read in the press, the people I've talked to, um, uh, et cetera. So, so, so I'm basing my opinion on what, what I know, but it, I can't vouch for 100% accuracy. But my understanding is that, is that um, uh, back in 1999, um, uh, uh, and prior to 99 that, that Mr. Haugie and Marcus Carter um, worked together and were actually friends. Um, and and uh, Mr. Haugie would, would do, participate in a lot of activities at the gun club um, and he would actually teach classes on, on uh, uh, gun laws uh, for individuals in the club. And um, there was some argument or dispute between Mr. Haugie and Mr. Carter um, and shortly thereafter, uh, a couple of investigators from Pierce County came and confiscated one of Mr. Carter's firearms. Um, and shortly thereafter, he was, he was charged with unlawful uh, possession of a machine gun, um, which uh, under state law is, is unlawful. A fully automatic weapon is, is not lawful uh, to have unless you're law enforcement or the military. Um, and uh, Mr. Carter represented himself. Uh, and uh, over the course of the next 15 years, um, the case, you know, had been dismissed for a variety of reasons, at least three or four times, and gone up on appeal and been sent back down. Um, and over the course of that, uh, Mr. Haugie uh, made a number of very inflammatory public statements about Mr. Carter. Um, and there are rules of professional conduct that specifically apply to prosecutors. And they are forbidden, uh, prosecutors are forbidden from making public statements which would unduly prejudice uh, a pending case and the defendant. Um, and he made some very inflammatory statements about Mr. Carter um, and talked about things that, that he wasn't even charged with. Um, he, he would say things like, like, Mr. Carter is manufacturing machine guns and, and putting them into commerce in Kitsap County. And, he won't allow, and Mr. Hobby said he wouldn't allow that. He was not charged with manufacturing machine guns. He was not charged with selling or distributing machine guns. Um, and there's actually a Facebook post that, that Mr. Haugie uh, uh, put on, and I think it's actually on the Kitsap Sun uh, website, 
where he goes on about how he, Mr. Hoggy said, you know, he doesn't, he's not, he, he likes guns, he owns guns, he shoots guns, this isn't personal and everything, but talking about the case, and, and clearly from reading that, it is personal, it is personal. I mean, the first thing Mr. Hoggy should have done, if there was evidence that Mr. Carter um, had committed a crime, the first thing Mr. Hoggy should have done was recuse himself from that case. Um, because he had a, both a personal and professional relationship with Mr. And Mr. Carter, and he should not have been involved in any charging decision, or, or and certainly not making public comments about Mr. Carter. Um, I don't know if Mr. Carter actually had a fully automatic weapon. If I had evidence, um, if, if I was presented as a prosecutor with evidence um, that, that Marcus Carter or anyone else uh, uh, unlawfully possessed a fully automatic weapon, I absolutely would charge that case. Um, my understanding of this particular case is that the prosecutor could never prove that it was a fully automatic weapon. And that was the, the final issue on, on dismissal. Um, that's something that he should have been able to figure out 15 years ago before he, fired, before he filed that, that case. I, I, I'm not aware of any, I mean, any valid reason to pursue a, a, another individual did a public records request and estimates that there are at least $300,000 that were spent uh, prosecuting this case. Um, if, if there's an individual who's a serial killer or a major threat to society, you know, absolutely you want to put all your resources behind that, um, even if it's a marginal case because the public safety warrants it. There was no justification for spending that amount of time and resources when he couldn't even prove that it was an automatic weapon. Marcus Carter is not a convicted felon. Marcus Carter, as far as I know, uh, has never committed a crime, and yet he was pursuing him as if he was some major threat to society. Um, and I do not understand it. Based upon the facts I know, I do not understand how anyone could dedicate so much resources to that. Not only that, but what Mr. Hauge did basically ripped this community apart. Um, and, and, and I just say that based upon all the people that I've talked to. I mean, and, and, and it is so, and there's so much repair that needs to be done by the next prosecutor in, in restoring community trust and confidence in this office because not only Mr. Hauge's actions do they taint you know, himself, but the office in general let and the ask, county in general. Let me ask you a question about that because I think that's an interesting thing to say, you know, the Terry Park dogs, yeah, it did, it got all the headlines. There's this stuff, and you hear this come up often at the forums. But how does a prosecutor, and you even, I think one of your public service is not politics, is one of your slogans, because then that's, that's politics, having to have a read of the community, and what is my decision, how is that going to play out as far as people's feelings go? Um, but I, how I would do say, you, how do you make those decisions? I would say that's, that's not politics, that's leadership. And, and a good leader, um, because, because the prosecutor is a leader in the county. And, and people, the prosecutor has a lot of authority. And, and it's important that people in the community respect that authority and they need to respect that person as a leader and they need to respect that person's judgment. It's not political at all. And, and a prosecutor needs to be able to, to, to read you know, his or her constituents and understand what their concerns are. And it's not just being a good litigator and winning cases. You have to be a good negotiator. You have to be a good mediator. Um, and, and, most, and you have to be a good manager, um, and, and everything you do uh, is going to reflect on the office and, and on the county as well, because I mean the, the, the prosecutor is the advisor to the county, uh, 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 you know, all, all the county officials, um, uh, uh, county commissioners, all, all, the, all the departments, et cetera. And, and so uh, the, the, the sense that I get from, from people in the community is that, is that, is that Everything, everything with Mr. Hauge is personal, um, and and you you have to you have to divorce yourself. It's not personal. It, it's it's about ensuring the justice is done, and that's the prosecutor's main role. It doesn't it, it, you know you shouldn't worry if people are, are criticizing you for a certain decision. If you can justify it and explain why this is justice, why this is important to the community, that's that that's what he needs to be able to do. And unfortunately. He has made everything, all these major decisions look like they're just personal, um, and and that's how it looks to me and many, many people in the community, and that just destroys confidence. Um, let me ask you about uh, this thing we've, we've done with each candidate who's come through. There's three other 
there's three issues that have been common themes in our paper recently. Um, and one of them is uh, drug use increasing, especially the, the use of heroin. Uh, we're noticing that more often. And the second one is um, mentally ill and the criminal, um, whether it intersects with criminal behavior and, and resources, uh, law enforcement resources. And the third one is um, Bremerton's police chief has made a big uh, issue of this is the frequent flyers uh, going after reoffenders because that's where a lot of the resource also goes to. It's a very small amount of people committing crimes again and again and cause problems. <laughs> um, how, can, how, how can your office, if you're sitting in that chair, address each one of those things? Great. So I'll start with the first one, drug use. Um, so there, there are, are two new directions that I would go from how uh, Mr. Haugi currently runs the office. Um, one of the things I did in, in Seattle uh, uh, was to work with the defenders on uh, a new drug enforcement strategy. And the Defender uh, Association were, um, were, were trying to get a lot of drug cases dismissed based upon racial disparity and that there was bias in how the police were uh, enforcing the drug laws. And we spent a lot of time hiring experts, doing research, arguing before the court to, to no avail. I mean, I mean, racial disparity is a very hard, hard issue to, to define. It's a hard issue to prove. And, 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 and you can argue about it forever, and nothing ever gets done. And so finally, we sat down with the defenders, and we said, look, there's got to be, there's got to be a better way. We can litigate this for years and years and years, and nothing will change. So what we did, and what I, what I did specifically, was to look at you know what what does work, um, acknowledging that racial disparity is there, um, and what does work in terms of, of of reducing recidivism, getting getting people uh, uh, the treatment that they need, um, reducing jail costs, et cetera, et cetera. And what I looked at were programs in the United Kingdom and in Australia, and what they have is is a law enforcement diversion program where um, the nice thing about those two countries is that they have national health care systems, so they have treatment on demand. So anyone who wants treatment for whatever it is can get it. So what they did was they, they took law enforcement and, and put them into that treatment model. And so when law enforcement would go out and they would contact somebody that they had contacted 30 times before for minor offenses and they're all drug related and they knew they had an addiction problem, they would give them a choice. And they would say, look, I have this program um, treatment program, I can put you into that, um, or I can take you to jail and you can spend another night in jail and get back on the street and do it again. And so the pe so it's a voluntary program, um, uh, but when people do accept the program and go into it, very high success rate, um, and, and you have zero criminal justice costs. So with programs like drug court, you know, you have all the criminal justice costs except for jail, uh, but this program, you keep them out of the system entirely. It doesn't work for everybody, and it's, it's only for low-level offenders who have real substance abuse problems, but it, it takes one of the pieces of the puzzle away. Um, so I worked with the defenders, and, and uh, there's a, a, a woman by the name of Lisa Dugard, who's on one of my endorsement lists, if you go to my website, and um, she was a phenomenal fundraiser. So she's been a public defender for many years, always very adversarial with the police, adversarial with the prosecutor, and she said, look, we're gonna make this work. And she got millions of dollars in grant funding from the Soros Foundation, from the Ford Foundation, and a few other minor foundations for the treatment program services. And then she, together we built this coalition of, of I can't remember how many organizations are involved, but you have the King County Prosecutor, the City Attorney's Office, the Seattle Police Department, the King County Sheriff's, the ACLU, the Public Defenders, um, all these various treatment providers in Seattle, and created a program called Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, and you can find it on the web and get more information about it. Um, working with the Police Department and the Sheriff's Office, we picked two neighborhoods, one is in Skyway and one is in Belltown, and the Belltown is the largest one, where you have just chronic open-air drug markets, and you have a lot of residences, new high-rises coming in, lots of complaints, and, and there's no way the police can arrest their way out of the problem. There's always, it's, it's, just, it's just going to be there. Um, and so uh, for the last two or three years, um, uh, uh, we've had a program, there, there are currently just over 200 people in the program, 
where law enforcement will go out. These are people that they know very, very well. They know what all their issues are. They've arrested them multiple, multiple times, and they give them the option of, of going into lead or going to jail. And uh, most of them pick lead, and most of them have been successful. The University of Washington is currently doing a study to assess the effectiveness uh, of that program. Um, so that's one thing I would like to do here, but that, that requires, you can't do it unilaterally. I can't just come in and pro as prosecutor and say, I'm going to implement this program. You have to build a coalition. You have to, you have to be able to bring people to the table, all the, all the interested stakeholders, all the community groups that are, that, that are affected by this problem, and then you have to go and go to the funders. And, 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 and my experience has been, because I've, I've worked on many different coalitions on very different issues, um, if you can build the local group, if you can show the buy-in from local government, from, from private businesses, from neighborhood groups, from other service providers, you can get the funding. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for a coalition, a collaboration, um, a commitment, and, and the money will come. Um, and so I would like to lead that, that effort if, if, if I'm elected. Um, so that's one piece. The second piece is drug court. And uh, drug court is, is is an essential component. It's a therapeutic court, um, and, and it, it serves a purpose. The problem with the Kitsap County Drug Court is that um, they let almost anyone in. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm, my experience with drug court is that, is that it's, it's very rare, if ever, that, that a drug dealer will get be available uh, or have the services available at drug court. And the reason for that is the drug court is for people who have you know, addiction issues and are not committing very serious crimes. It's primarily possession. Um, and, um, and so they're the most amenable to treatment. And, and if, if you're selling drugs for profit, uh, even if you have an addiction problem, then, then you have other issues that drug court is not going to be able to help you with. And, and oftentimes incarceration is, is, is a more, a better deterrent. Um, and my understanding is that, is that um, uh, when I look at the I was able to get some information from Superior Court. I haven't been able to get any information from the prosecutor's office yet um, about the, the length of sentences um, that uh, individuals uh, who go through drug court are, are facing um, because that's how they calculate the savings. And they say, well, because they went through drug court, they weren't sentenced to so many years. And in order to get a prison sentence, you have to have, because they, in 2004, the state reduced the drug standard sentencing guidelines for drugs significantly to try to uh, reduce the prison population. So in order to do some significant prison time, you have to have five or more uh, drug, drug delivery convictions. Um, and uh, I was astounded at the amount of prison time um, that these individuals that were going through drug court were facing. I mean, uh, you're dealing with very chronic drug dealers. Uh, and, and I don't believe that drug court is in its appropriate use of resources. We need to, because those, those cost money, and, and you have treatment services available, and if you're not putting somebody who's amenable to treatment, who's appropriate for treatment through that, it's just a waste of money. Um, so I would pull back on the, on the standards for allowing individuals into drug court and, and focus it just on the users and then implement a lead program to, to, to get even the lower level offenders completely out of the system. So that's what I do for drugs. Um, mentally ill. Sorry. Um, we deal with this a lot with the, my current job with the Seattle Police Department. Um, uh, I, I don't know what the statistics are, but I would say you know more than half of of all you know arrests that are made for for particularly for violent crimes, property crimes. Um, you know, individuals will have either substance abuse and or a mental health problem. I mean, they're major drivers of, of, of criminal activity. And, and we do a pretty good job um, with the substance abuse problems uh, with, with, through drug court and other, other programs. We don't do a very good job with, with the mentally ill. Um, Seattle and King County each have a mental health court. Um, again, you can't set something like that up unilaterally. You have, to, you have to create a partnership and bring public health into it. You need a mental health professional that participates in that. It's a completely different model. It's not an adversarial model. Oftentimes, the defense attorney will have to give you know, damaging information to the court and, 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 uh, and the prosecutor about their client in order for them to get the appropriate treatment services that they need. Um, it's, a, it's a very 
complicated thing to set up. There are all sorts of privacy issues around healthcare information. Um, but when, when you do set it up and when it's set up properly, it has, it has amazing benefits. And we're going to have a forum uh, tomorrow night um, on Bainbridge Island, uh, specifically on mental health um, issues. So I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll save my, my other's response for that. But I would definitely want to work on setting up a mental health court. Um, finally, um, uh, frequent flyers. Um, we had a, um, um, a discussion yesterday at the at the Eggs and Issues uh, event um, about the filing standards of the prosecutor's office. And um, uh, one of the things that Tina Robinson uh, said was that uh, she feels that, that um, and she should know because she's a defense attorney, um, public defender, that, that the, the prosecutor's office has, has a habit of undercharging uh, felonies. Um, and that has been, from what I have seen uh, of the office, that has been my uh, experience as well. Uh, Mr. Hauge said, well, isn't it great that we, we rarely plea bargain our cases? Um, and he gave out the statistics for plea bargaining, which is something like 13% of their cases that they're filed are reduced. And my response to that was, well, you've already reduced it at the filing stage, that so you can't really go any lower. If you give somebody a sweetheart deal, a convicted or a felon who commits a felony, a sweetheart deal, of course they're going to plead guilty. You know, they're not going to argue about it. They're going to take the money and run. Um, so, so that I think is a is a big problem. The other big problem um, that's in Mr. Hauge's annual reports is that for the last four or five years, um, he has had a policy of filing felony cases as misdemeanors because he says he doesn't have the financial resources um, to prosecute those felony cases. And it's in his annual report that it's an injustice. He says, look, I'm doing this, but it's an injustice. But I have no choice because I don't have the financial resources to handle all these cases. Is this the felony early plea unit? No, this is, this, this, is, this, is, this is like expedited. The felony early plea unit is another problem. That also sends it to um, Right, but it right. doesn't. It, it sends felony cases to district court. This is this is change. this is actually filing okay. felony case that should be filed as felonies as misdemeanors to get defendants to plead out to the misdemeanor so they don't go the felony route because he says he doesn't have enough prosecution resources to, to deal with that. That is a huge problem. Um, and Mr. Hauge said, "Well, I've stopped doing that because the 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 you know, our economy has improved, I have uh, sufficient resources. So basically what that tells, you know, criminals in this county is, all right, you know, as long as you commit a felony when, when, when times are tough, financially, you'll be charged with a misdemeanor. But when times are good, you, you know, better be more careful. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And I would never, ever uh, make a filing decision based upon budgetary reasons. I think that's, that's, the right word is <laughs> terrible um, so one of the problems uh, with mr. Hauge's office is that he has more than enough money he has more than enough staff to do the job the problem is is that it's an incredibly top-heavy organization he has 18 managing attorneys all making over a hundred thousand dollars a year and only 22 deputies um, he has four chiefs, each making $127,000 a year, which is more money than any other county official, including the sheriff, including county commissioners. The only people that make more are the judges and Mr. Hauge. Um, he has 13 senior deputies, most of whom make the same amount as, as commissioners. Um, I would reduce management significantly, but I wouldn't cut positions. I would actually end up adding, I think I could add a net four deputy prosecutors. He all has almost no entry-level positions. Everybody's making much, much more um, than the entry-level position. How would, you, how would you eliminate those top-level jobs? Um, the, the county prosecutor, uh, the, the, the county council sets, or uh, uh, the county commissioners set the budget. Um, the, the, the prosecutor can, can everyone works at the pleasure of the prosecutor. Um, so there is, there is a, a guild, a union for, for the non-represented, uh, for the represented uh, attorneys. Um, but uh, my, my belief is, is that the, the county prosecutor has a lot of discretion in terms of how to organize the office. And uh, I would need to get authority from the, from the uh, county commissioners to create new positions. Um, but the nice thing is, is that I wouldn't have to increase my budget. Uh, in fact, I could, I could 
create a lot of savings. Um, Mr. Hauge has created so many different silos, um, and some some of his top managers, he has a he's a chief uh, deputy that has no direct reports. Nobody reports to her. Um, uh, I think you can easily, and in most offices, I, I don't know with an office with with 40 attorneys, why you need four chiefs. It, it makes no sense. I mean, in all the offices that I've seen and worked in, you have two chiefs. You have a chief criminal and you have a chief civil. And, uh, and each senior deputy should have four or five attorneys reporting to them. Um, and Mr. Hauge's office is just, if, when you look at the org chart, it's just like this. It's so wide and, and, and nobody's at the entry level. So by reducing management, I could actually uh, increase, have a net increase. I think I could get up to 44 attorneys um, in, in the office um, with no, no increase in the budget. In fact, there would be some budgetary savings. I would create some entry level positions. And with that, I could do things such as creating the uh, community liaison program. We certainly would never ever file uh, felonies as misdemeanors. Um, and the other thing I would do with the extra um, attorneys is create a dedicated position for public disclosure. Uh, I think there's a huge problem um, uh, with the prosecutor's office, both in terms of their own production of records and advising other county departments on the production of records. And you need to have, that's, that's what I did for Seattle as the Director of Government Affairs. I managed the attorneys that, that did public disclosure and I know you need dedicated staff, dedicated attorneys who are, uh, the law changes very quickly. Um, there, there's, there's huge liability risks if you do it wrong. Um, you need a dedicated prosecutor um, for public disclosure, and right now there isn't. Um, I wanted to ask you also, in your opening statement, and I read this in the Voter's Guide as well, um, you talk about something called vertical prosecution. Yes. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So, um, most prosecutor's office, including Mr. Hauge's office, um, uh, divide up a case among several deputies. Um, so you have a filing unit. Um, so a case will come in and, and uh, uh, a filing deputy will look at it, read the police report, read the statement of probable cause, and make a filing decision. And um, so they will charge the case and file the information. And uh, depending on how your office is structured, that, that would be the end of their involvement. And then it would go to another deputy who would handle the arraignment, um, which is a pretty simple hearing and nothing really much happens. You just make sure that the defendant's advised and has counsel and so forth. And then, um, then it would go to uh, an omnibus hearing where you would sort of decide where the case is going and another attorney might handle that. Then if it went to a plea, then another attorney would handle the plea and then at sentencing, another attorney might handle the sentencing. If it went to trial, another attorney would handle the trial. Um, so it's a very efficient way to prosecute cases, um, uh, uh, but the problem is, is that um, you, you know, things can fall through the cracks. Um, there's no deputy that is intimately familiar with the case as well as a defense attorney would be about the case. Um, and so for, um, for very serious cases in, in King County, they have uh, what's called the MDOT program, Most Dangerous Offender Program. So any homicide, any, any you know, rape in the first degree, you know, assault in the first degree, all the class A felonies would go to the Most Dangerous Offender Program and they would have their most senior deputies working in that program and they would handle the case from start to finish. So labor intensive, you need a lot more resources to, to do that, um, but for certain types of cases, um, that's appropriate. So I would implement a vertical prosecution program for all class A felonies. Um, there aren't a lot of them. It's not like a high volume thing, but you need to have, and I would not only implement a vertical prosecution program, I would have two deputies assigned to each class A felony. Um, so one would be either a senior or a chief deputy, and the other would be just a regular deputy, because uh, I think you really need that, that teamwork um, for those, those most important cases. And I've, I've seen, um, and we can talk about examples if you want, I've seen numerous examples of, of cases falling through the cracks in the, in the Kitsap prosecutor's office, because so many deputies handle the case, um, and, and uh, the so right hand doesn't know what the left the, hand the is The advantage doing. basically is you are keeping your most talented person on the most serious crimes all the way and walking them all your the most way. talented people and the same people um, so they know the case from start to finish from the time that the, the, the police lost. report comes in they read it they know the case inside and out they don't have to get it just before a hearing and read it and try to figure out what's going on and and because 
especially for these for these serious complicated cases I mean you you will have you may have you know dozens of witnesses you know there's complicated facts there may be mental defenses and, and and you need to know you know you need to have time to prepare you can't just do it the day before and so that's what I did in, in King County um, we, we got a grant um, and, and I was I developed this vertical prosecution program I, I can give you the report I did uh, that was published by Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention but basically that's what I did with juvenile firearm cases I was the only person in the juvenile unit every single firearm case that was juvenile firearm crime that was committed in King County went through me and I handled it from start to finish and so the cases were filed faster um, we got a better plea rate and, and a better conviction rate at trial because there were lots of nuances there and I did a lot of training for law enforcement about how to prove you know how, how what evidence do we need to prove these cases um, and and it, it but you don't there's no prosecutor's office that can do it for every case and you don't want to do it for if you have a shoplifting you don't want to have a, a vertical prosecution program so it's only and, and there may be other things once I get into office there may be other areas that, that that you may want to develop a vertical prosecution so it's only for those sort of chronic problem issues and the most serious offenses Thanks. Um, do you have a question? Um, well, we're kind of coming up on the time we had allotted for this. Okay. Um, we covered a lot of ground, but if there's anything that we didn't touch on that you want to make sure that we know about you or, or platforms from you, um, if you want to kind of wrap up your statement with that. And, sure. and the only other thing that I kind of always ask on the last statement is, you know, tell us what you think sets you apart uh, from, from the person in that job right now. Sure. Um, I think one thing that, that is very um, exciting about this particular race um, is that uh, we're the the only county in the state that has a primary for prosecutor with the incumbent prosecutor. Um, generally, as Mr. Hauge has done for many years, generally prosecutors run unopposed, and so the voters don't have any choice. And this time, for the first time, I think in history, at least in the last 40 years, um, the voters are going to have a real choice on who their next prosecutor is going to be. And each of the candidates is very different. Um, and from different parties, we have different backgrounds, experiences, talents, opinions, and I'm hoping that, that all of this will come out and through interviews such as this and through our forums and, and, and uh, other during the campaign so that, so that people will be as educated as possible. One of the main concerns is that very few people vote in a, in a, in a non-presidential year primary. Um, and this is an extremely important position in the county. It's an extremely important race, and for the first time, people have a choice. I think I'm the best candidate uh, because I'm the only one. I have more prosecution, criminal experience, hands-on, than all three candidates, other candidates combined, including Mr. Hauge. Mr. Hauge was only a deputy prosecutor for 18 months in the 80s. I don't know how many trials he did, but generally you don't do more than misdemeanors in your first year. He's only tried one case uh, in the last 20 years himself. That's one thing that I would do differently. I would be trying cases uh, as well, not a lot, but I would be uh, involved because I don't think you can be a prosecutor and manage deputies in the court if you yourself have not had personal experience uh, and keep your skills up. I want to keep my skills up uh, as much as possible. I'm the only candidate with the civil uh, municipal law experience. Um, uh, even though Mr. Hauge has been the prosecutor, he doesn't have hands-on experience at actually handling a First Amendment case, actually handling a public disclosure request. Um, and I've, I've managed um, um, uh, uh, budgets, uh, the Bainbridge Island budget, about $50 million, uh, and uh, I wasn't personally managing it, but I was, I was helping the council make decisions, uh, major, major budget decisions, and I certainly understand how budgets are put together. Uh, I've managed uh, teams of attorneys in the city attorney's office and the King County Prosecutor's office. I've managed countless interdepartmental inter, uh, teams, uh, interjurisdictional teams. I've worked on a, 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 a local, a state, and a national level on many different projects. I would bring uh, a fresh perspective, a lot of new ideas, and, and a, a community service, public service approach to the office that has not existed in the last 20 years. Thanks, Bob. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Good to talk for a little while. Yeah.